Hey everyone. So today I participated in this Code Forces Division 3 contest and I recorded my participation live. And here I'm just recording a commentary over it. Alright, so getting started. The first problem. So what we want to do here is we want to check if the number has any odd divisor at all, uh, other than just one. So if you think about dividing all the powers of 2 out of a number, you'll always end up with an odd number at the end. For example, if you start with 12, then you'll get 6, then you'll get 3, and then 3 is an odd number. So the answer would be true if you could divide out all the powers of 2 and you would get a number greater than 1. And the answer would be false if once you divide out all the 2's, you end up with 1. So what we can do is we can just check to see if n is a power of 2. If n is a power of 2, the answer is no. If it's not a power of 2, the answer is yes. So that's what we're doing here. And we're using the function built-in pop count, which counts the number of 1 bits in the binary representation of a number. And if it's a power of 2, then there's a single 1 followed by a bunch of zeros. Right. So for B, what we want to do is we want to figure out if you can represent a number as the sum of a bunch of 2020s and a bunch of 2021s. So if you look at the bounds, the numbers themselves go up to a million, and then there are 10,000 test cases. So if we can solve each test case in approximately a thousand steps, then this will be fast enough. And it turns out that we can do that fairly simply. And the way to do that is uh, kind of parameterize your, your combination as some number of 2020s and some number of 2021s, which here I actually assigned to constants A and B. The reason for that is, um, you know, avoids typos, makes the code easier to read, things like that. So we can try all different possibilities for how many A's we have. And then for each of those, we can look at the remainder and check to see if it's equal to a multiple of b, which would mean that we could make the remainder with b's. So the runtime of this is O of n over a, because there are n over a different multiples of a that are less than n. And this is fast enough, because that's what, that would be a million divided by around 2,000, which is around like 1,000, roughly. Um, yeah, and my variables here are slightly confusing because here x is actually the total sum of all the 2020s and y is the number of 2021s, but as long as you keep track of what you're doing, it's, um, it's okay. Now, the next problem here was a combinatorics problem. It's definitely a bit tricky. So the idea is you have k different pairs and you want to pick two of them. And each pair has a boy first and a girl second. And then you want to make sure that you never pick two pairs that have a person in common. So the way that I did this, <laughs> you can see I'm thinking of it. The way that I did this was I broke it down via casework. So if you just pick any two pairs, there are four different cases. Um, they have no one in common, which is the case that we actually want to count they have the boy in common, and they have the girl in common. And the last case is that they have both people in common, which would mean that they're the same pair. And if you look ex if you look carefully at the problem statement, it says each pair is specified at most once, so we don't actually have to think about that case. So the way that I approach this is, first we counted up all the, all the pairs of pairs, or all the ways to pick two pairs. Um, I guess I'll call them couples so that I don't say the word pair twice. So all the ways to pick a pair of couples. And then I subtracted out the ways to pick two couples that both have the same boy. And then I subtracted out how many ways you can pick two couples that both have the same girl. Um, yeah, so I guess let's look at the implementation. Oh, and the way to do this is we're computing n choose 2, right? Which is n times n minus 1 over 2. Um, and then to compute the number of ways to actually find um, 
So the total number of ways to make a pair of couples is just k choose 2. And then the number of ways to find a pair of couples with the same boy would be for each boy, see how many couples they're in and figure out how to pick two of those. Um, so you can see here the first thing I'm doing is I'm making a list of how many times or how many pairs each boy is a part of and how many pairs each girl is a part of. Um, and you know, uh, I guess one, one little tidbit is in my code, you'll notice I'm not actually writing boy and girl anywhere because it's just part of the story. Um, I definitely find it a little easier and cleaner to think about these problems when you you just use the variables from the statement rather than using the concepts from the statement. Um, occasionally it's helpful to use the concepts if they help illustrate the problem, but in a lot of cases it's just like, I don't know, one more thing to typo or misread or this way kind of, if you have two equivalent problems your solutions will look more similar. So yeah, what we're doing here is we're just using a map to count up how frequently each boy appears and each girl appears. So that's frequency A and B. And there's actually a bunch of copy pasting in this code. So when you're copy pasting, always be super careful to make sure you change everything. Um, you'll see later I had some issues with the problem because of that. Cool, yeah, so we did K choose two and then we subtracted out um, the number of pairs choose two for each of the other each of the other, um, each of the individual boys and each of the individual girls, and then we submit it. Um, cool. And so far this contest is going well. The queue is not long, but later it will be. So you'll see we submit some problems and then they don't get judged for like half an hour. <laughs> um, cool. So for D, this is kind of a long complicated problem statement. And um, but basically what it's saying is you want to pick some set of applications whose sizes add up to at least M, but you want to minimize the convenience points. But the thing that's convenient about this is, um, oh, sorry, one second. Um, so the thing that's uh, convenient here is that the convenience points are either one or two. So the inconvenience of doing this kind of adds up to, you can parameterize it in terms of how many ones there are and how many twos there are. And it turns out you can go through all the possibilities for this. Um, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna, we're gonna fix the number of ones that we pick out and we're gonna pick out the um, let's say we pick out i different applications that are worth one. We're just going to pick the i biggest ones. And then what we're going to do is we're going to see how many applications of, si or of convenience two we would need to pick out in order to make the total m. And then once we've considered all those possibilities of pairs of uh, how many ones and how many twos, we're just going to pick the one that's the best. And I did this using a binary search, but I believe you could also do it with a two-pointer solution. It kind of boils down to whatever you find easier to code. Um, so the sometimes the binary search can be slightly slower than the two-pointers, right? You have a, an extra log factor, but in this case, we're actually sorting everything first, so it's already in log n. And typically when you're doing competitive programming, you you don't want to over optimize for runtime. You just want to make your runtime fast enough to comfortably pass all the test cases. And then you want to optimize for making it as easy to code as possible. So what we're doing here is we divided all the applications into ones that are worth one and ones that are worth two. And then we sorted those in reverse because we always want to pick the biggest ones available. And then to make things uh, faster and easier later, I computed the prefix sums. Um, so this would just be the prefix sum, the first element is zero, and then each element after that, the ith element is the sum of the first i elements of your original array. So now here, yeah, you also have to be careful of your boundary conditions. Um, 
So here what I'm doing is I'm going through, as we said, all the possible amounts of the one type applications. All right, yeah, you always have to be careful. So the size of one prefix is actually the size of one plus one. And then you have to be careful of the, the less versus the less than or equal to. And you'll notice that I use longs here. I believe for this problem that is necessary um, because the sum, even if m is fit, fitting in an int, the problem might be that you might just have a ton of huge applications that add up to some larger number and have overflow. So, all right, so what we're doing here is once we've picked i of the one type applications, we want to figure out how many two type applications we need. So we do that by binary searching for the the first value such that picking that many two type operations gives you the remainder or less. So that's what um, standard lower bound does. And here our score will be i plus 2j, right? Because each of the two type applications cost us two. And then, yeah, there's just a little edge case here where what if you pick so few one type applications that it's actually impossible to finish using only two type applications? So I have this, um, if picking all the two type applications would still be less than the remainder we need, we just continue and we skip this case. And note that it's possible that we skip all the cases, in which case uh, answer would stay at 1e9, which I just used as my infinity here. Um, cool, so that's D. By the way, in the future, I would have preferred to use a constant for infinity rather than typing 1e9 twice, just to prevent any potential mishaps. Cool. So e is a <laughs> e is another one with a slightly complicated statement. So it's definitely really important to get good at reading these statements and distilling out the core of the problem. So for E, essentially what we have is we have a bunch of items. <laughs> uh, we have a bunch of numbers in a list, and we want to select k of them to maximize their sum. Um, there is a little bit of, at first it seems more complicated than that because each blogger has some number of followers, and then you want like the union of all their follower sets to be maximized, which seems like maybe difficult, but then it actually says at some point that each follower only follows one blogger. So all these sets are completely disjoint, so you're basically just adding up numbers. Um, cool. So, all right, cool. So it looks like I started coding it up. And so basically the idea here is you just want to pick the biggest ones, right? Like, for example, in the example they have where they have one, three, one, two, and you have to pick three of them, you want to pick three, two, and one um, if you sorted it. So then the trick is the only way that you could get the same sum with, a, with picking different elements would be if you had multiple copies of the smallest element that you either did or didn't pick, and then you could choose which of those to pick. So basically what we're going to do here is we're going to... So in this case, right, we have um, 3, 2, 1, 1 in this example, and we want to pick 3, 2, and 1, which means that there are two ones, one of which we want to pick. So the number of ways to do that would be two choose one, or just two. You could either pick the first one or the second one. Um, so what I did here, I had a little, um, I made a little mistake here where I tried to find this using binary search, but my list was sorted in reverse. So lower bound and upper bound just always gave me the, the first element. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely be careful of that. And in this case, it's not necessary to use binary search. Um, I think I just did it because I felt that it was kind of uh, simple and clear, but you could also easily do this with a for loop. So the way to do this with a for loop would just be to, you know, once you've sorted your array A in reverse, you, and I think that actually probably would have been simpler to code in this case. Um, I just didn't think of it. So here I like, you know, carefully reversed all my indices. I was like, oh, we want the like, the n minus 1 minus k. Oh no, just n minus k, right? Um, so you also have to be careful of that. But 
basically the idea here is now L comma R gives us our interval that contains these like actually flexible numbers, um, the ones that we can switch out for other numbers. And if you look at where N minus K falls within that interval, that tells you how many of them you have to pick. And then from that point on, it's just a single binomial coefficient, uh, N choose R. And here I have a pre-written mod num class that just allows you to quickly compute binomials, uh, modulo, whatever, which is super convenient. I definitely recommend it. Um, and then here I actually have a bit of a compile error because this, I think, uh, this mod num class needs to be updated. It uses a resize macro somewhere in it. Um, but my my header doesn't have that resize macro, so I just replaced it with you know actual resize. But cool, so that's that problem. We passed the samples, we submitted, and at this point, this is where the queue starts to hit. Like you know, I'm pretty excited to see how I'm doing on this contest. Maybe I'll get like top twenty or something, which would be awesome. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll we'll see when I look at the standings. It'll it'll be kind of funny. Anyway, there's only F and G left now. So, so F is uh, F is a pretty cool one. I think it's pretty like uh, it has like some standard ideas. It's definitely good to think about. Ah, so here I look at the standings and like I'm doing great, right? I'm in tenth. Like my E is still in the Q, so I'm probably gonna shoot up to like third or something. Um. But but we'll we'll see what I discover later about the standings. <laughs> okay, so for F, the idea is you have a matrix of ones and zeros, and they're saying you like vertical XOR and horizontal XOR, but basically you're just inverting uh, a whole row or a whole column. Um, you can also think of this like one of those games where you have like a grid of cells that are either white or black, and you like can flip all the cells in a single row or single column. And we want to make A equal to B. And there's kind of a nice implementation trick here where what you do is you just look at where A and B are different, and then you XOR A and B. And that and now you have some thing that you want to just turn into zero. And that way you don't have to have as many if statements or as complicated a condition. So that's definitely a, a good one, right? This is kind of the this is kind of like a complicated analog of if you had two integers a and b and you wanted to add stuff to a to make it b, you could also just imagine like starting from zero and going to b minus a, or starting from a minus b and going to zero, or something like that. So here we're just reading the input. Um, instead of keeping everything as strings, which I feel is maybe more easy to make a mistake, I just converted everything to ints. Um, definitely a big fan of this. Uh, another little tip is like a lot of the time when you read the input, especially if it's like as strings, it's in a slightly unfriendly format where it's easy to make mistakes. And I think a lot of the time it's it's easiest to just at the time that you're reading it, transform it into a more friendly representation. And then you don't have to think about like, you know, subtracting like car zero from like the int to value or, or whatever, like throughout solving the problem. Um, this is kind of analogous to a lot of time you have problems with permutations and they're one indexed and then you want to decrement everything by one when you read it in so that your code is zero indexed. So here I'm just checking to make sure I read the input correctly. This is definitely a bit of an implementation problem. But the, so the core idea here is that You actually, once you make a single decision, then all the rest of the flips, there's only one possible way to do them. And then you might reach a contradiction or you might not. So you can actually just simulate both possibilities, see if they work, and then that's it. Uh, the important part is you have to see if they work at the end. So here I'm just writing like some boilerplate code like I want to easily be able to flip a single row without having to write out the for loop each time, so I 
wrote a lambda for that, and I wrote a lambda for the columns. And here, actually, um, you'll notice I make a mistake. I oh, what am I doing? Oh yeah, so I I also switched up a bit like the signature of this. Um, kind of as I was coding, I was like, maybe it'll be easier this way. No, it'll actually not. It'll be easier this way. Um, so there's a little back and forth in this problem for sure. But the mistake that I ended up making here, which you can see, is I when I update call to use I or yeah to use J instead of I. I believe I update the for loop inside, but I don't fully update it. So it ends up having a incorrect like terminating condition. Yeah, so I changed that to I and then, but I still have J is less than N, J plus plus, right? So now call is just like a, a weird version of row instead of like what it actually should be. Okay, so back to the core idea for this problem. Um, so let's consider the very top left entry. And, oh, and you can see here, by the way, that I did the thing I mentioned where um, you compute A, X, or B, which is like the difference that you need to achieve. And now you need to turn this new array into zero. That way you don't have a bunch of, um, you know, a bunch of like checking if A is equal to B and casework like that. So the core idea here is the top left element. Let's just think about that. So if it's correct already, then we can either flip its row and column or we can flip neither. And if it's incorrect, we can flip its row or its column, or we can, yeah, I mean, that's it. You can flip only the row or only the column. Um, so now that we've done that, we've already decided whether we're flipping the first row, like let's just pick one arbitrarily. Now we've already decided whether we're going to flip the first row at all. And let's say we are gonna flip the first row and it's done, or we're not and whatever. Then what we do is we go through each other element of the first row. And the only way to fix those now is by flipping their columns. So our decision of whether to flip each column is now decided for us because, um, you know, it's just decided by what those elements are. And yeah, so here I'm looking at the standings. I'm like, what's going on? Why isn't my E being judged? <laughs> I want to jump into like first or whatever. Um, but... So the idea here, right, is now we have all of our decisions about the columns made for us already. And then we can do the same thing with the rows. We can look at the first element of every row. We already know whether we flipped the first column or not. So then the decision of whether to flip each row just comes down to what that element is. And then once we've made all these decisions, um, we've made all the decisions that we can make. So we just check if the matrix is equal to all zeros. And if it is, then we're done. If it's not, then we should try the other of the two possibilities for the the, the top right, or sorry, the top left element. <laughs> yeah, so we're chilling in the queue. <laughs> I spent a bit of time here just looking at the standings because I was like confused as to what's going on. And then I saw that like, you know, Neil was actually, his E was in the queue, but his F and G were also in the queue. So he was just done at this point. Um, which is pretty wild, but um, cool. So let's keep plugging away. <coughs> I definitely did a bit of refactoring, just trying to write this as cleanly as possible so I didn't make mistakes. Okay, yeah, so here we go. Um, you'll notice that I pass in the vector vector of ints v into the test function uh, without the ampersand. So it actually copies when you pass it in which most of the time you want to avoid because it would slow down your code. But in this case, I do want to copy it because I want to preserve the original matrix for my second try. Um, cool. And then I put the row and column then as inside this test lambda just because that way it'll operate on this passed in matrix. All right, so here we go. So you'll notice my column function is still wrong, by the way. It should not have that J in the in the loop condition or the increment. So we have a, a Boolean that's just whether we're going to flip the first row or not, because that uniquely determines whether we're flipping 
both the row and column or neither in the case of a zero or we're flipping the row or the column in the case of a one. So then the first column decision is based on the first row decision. And then here I do what I described where I go through all the elements of the first column to check each row and then I go through all elements of the first row to check each column. Which earlier I described out loud the other way but you can see it's the same either way. Um, and then now what I want to do is write out you know, more for loops and check whether all the elements of this matrix are zero as we intended. So if any of the elements are non-zero, then we immediately return false because it doesn't work. Otherwise, we'll return true. Um, awesome. So now we're almost done. We're going to, the answer is going to be, right, we're testing by passing in a copy of our matrix and saying we will flip the first row or a copy of our matrix and we're not going to flip the first row. And I just changed our difference matrix to D instead of V, just so we wouldn't shadow a variable, because that might be a source of bugs later. Cool, so we run into the samples, the samples fail, and then here I'm gonna try debugging the, the call error that I made. So let's see how I actually do that. <laughs> so I guess I just read everything again. I'm kind of like, what's going on? Let's enjoy the show. Well, so I'm just reading, <laughs> reading the statement, reading my code. Now I'm trying to print, so I'm printing the original matrix that we pass in. Um, then I'm printing it after I do the first, like the first like decision. And then I'm gonna pass it, uh, sorry, not pass it in. I'm gonna print it after um, we should be finished with it. Right, so. Now I'm just going through and I'm gonna hand trace like the first example, so. And then I'm going to, you know, realize that something's wrong. <laughs> so in the first example, which they also made easy because they made B all zeros. So that was nice. Um, we're looking at, well, when we flip the first row, then we don't want to flip the first column. And then we look at all the rows that we want to flip. So we want to flip the last row as well. And then once we've done that, we should have zero, zero, 001 in every row. So then we would want to flip just the last column. Um, and that's, and then, but what we end up doing is we somehow don't flip the last column. So that's really weird. And also, I think if you look carefully, this, uh, this state that we've achieved at the end is actually an illegal state. Um, like it wouldn't be possible to get that via any operations, much less the operations we want. So I fix my bug, it passes the samples. Um, all right, let's go. And then the, the queue is still going at this point. Like, my E is still chilling in the queue. Um, okay, cool. So let's, uh, let's look at G. G is a pretty cool one. We basically want to, we, we start with an array. And we want to keep some of the elements so that for every pair, you have um, one of the elements is divisible by the other, or both, um, if the two elements are equal, for example. So what we have here is kind of a situation where you'll notice that the order of the elements doesn't matter anywhere in any of these conditions or statements. So let's think about sorting the array. So if you sort the array, and you have like the first element divides the second element and the second element divides the third element. Well, first of all, if you sort the array, um, you're always gonna have the first element divide the second element or any element will divide any element later than it because the element later than it will be greater than or equal to it. So that reduces this like, 
there are two possibilities to just there's one possibility, which is awesome already. And now, um, the thing is, if every element divides the next element, that already means that every element will divide all the elements after it. And the reason for that is because divisibility is transitive. So for example, if we know that 5 divides 50, and we know that 50 divides 200, then we automatically know that 5 divides 200 as well. Because you can multiply 5 by something to get 50, and you can multiply 50 by something to get 200. So of course you can multiply 5 by something to get 200, by like combining those two multiplications. Um, cool. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do a DP. And um, in, our, in our DP, what we're going to do is we're going to think about all of the array so far. Like, so we've sorted our array, right? And now we only care what the last element of our array is. Because we know if the last element of our array divides the new stuff that we append, then all the previous ones will as well, because of this divisibility is transitive condition or property. So the cool thing that we're going to do here now is we're going to think about, like, we're going to do a DP. So we're going to find the largest array that we could get with each possible value of the last element. Um, and you'll notice here that the elements themselves are less than a small number. So what we can do is we can just go through all the possible values instead of having to, like, go through only the values that make sense or, like, that show up in the array or something. So we're going to make a frequency array, right? So if you have um, input, like, 1, 2, 2, 3 then that would be like one, two, one, because there's like one, one, two, twos, and one, three. Um, and you'll notice here that this frequency array uh, also has like some zeros in it, but that's just going to be zero. Um, the reason I did that is that it's just simpler, right? If you can do frequency of i is how many times i appears instead of frequency of i minus one is how many times i appears. Um, so now for our DP, right, we're computing the maximum size of a subarray, or not a subarray, but the maximum size of uh, an array that you can get. And then the answer at the end will be n minus this maximum size, because the answer is the elements that we want to remove. Um, so here I actually just kind of coded it a little too quickly, and I wrote something completely wrong. <laughs> um, but the core idea is here. So if you look at the runtime of this, on its surface, it looks like it's n squared, which is definitely too slow. Or not n squared, but um, m squared, I guess, where m is the maximum element of a, which has the same bound as n. Um, so this looks like it's m squared, because you have this, uh, this loop over i that goes through m elements, and then you have this loop over j that could go through up to m elements, right? Like, if i is 1, for example, it'll go through everything. But the runtime of this loop is actually n log n, and the reason for that is that if you look at each different value of i, um, first you have n over i, uh, you have n over i different values of j. And so if you factor out the n, you get n times the sum of 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 and so on, which is, um, it's the harmonic series, and I believe that grows asymptotically with like log of the number of elements. Um, you can already tell it's going to grow pretty slowly, right? Because like once you're adding like one, 1 over 100, to like a 1 over 101 and stuff, you're not really changing it much. So this runs in n log n, or m log m, and there are 10 test cases, so that should be fine. It would be like a million times like log of 2 times 10 to the fifth or something. Um, here I tried running it with... Uh, with the maximum size just to make sure it ran locally like fast enough and that I wasn't going to get, especially because of the long queue, right? I really didn't want to submit and get TLE because I would learn that I got TLE like 20 minutes later <laughs> um, after sitting around doing nothing for 20 minutes. Um, cool. So that's G. And the thing that we're doing here is we're saying that if we have, um, if we have I as the, uh, <laughs> um, 
if we have an element that ends with a, sorry, an array that ends with a certain value, then what you can do is you can extend that array to the to the next value. Um, cool. So that's basically it for the actual contest. Like I'm done with the contest at this point. Um, the rest of it is just me waiting for the queue and wondering what's going on. So let me open up G and explain it a little bit more. And I'll, we'll also take a look at the standings. So it turns out at the end, I ended up getting 13th, which is super awesome. Definitely happy to see that. Um, and the, the quick explanation of G, which I'll... Oh, whoops, my webcam disappeared. Um, so the quick explanation of G is that for a given um, ending element, what we're doing is we can add up all the copies of that element and add them to our thing. And then for each multiple of it, we could have this array. Um, you can pick any kind of divisor, right? So we're kind of, that's how we're, we're updating this. Um, that might not be super clear, but I think uh, there should be some other sources to, to talk about this problem. And um, I just wanted to mostly record over the screencast for today. So I think I'll, I'll end the broadcast here. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for joining and definitely a fun contest. I encourage you all to, to check it out if you have a chance. You can see F took me quite a while, <laughs> um, but super pleased with my performance, right? There are a lot of strong people around me on the standings list. So yeah, thanks.